I take it from your chapter on historical materialism that Marx's key contribution to the study of history is his observation and, and analysis that changes in society are propagated by changes in economics. Is this roughly correct? That's roughly correct. I mean, there's, there's different ways you can formulate it. I mean, uh, you know, a, a slightly more precise way of putting it, which is to say that um, he thinks it's growth and development in productive power, and in particular technology very broadly construed, um, that brings about changes in society. And it brings about changes in society through the mechanism of class struggle. So probably his most important contribution to the actual practice of history is to uh, call attention to the role that conflicts between different economic classes, where classes roughly can be defined in terms of what ownership they have or don't have in the existing technologies, in the existing productive power in society. Um, how conflicts between classes with different economic interests, given what productive power they own, how those conflicts explain historical developments. Right? Um, and that's the, you know, the, the version of historical materialism uh, that Marx, Marx and Engels characterize in the Communist Manifesto is, say, the history of all society hitherto is the history of you know, class struggle, class conflict. Um, now, there's a more formal statement of historical materialism that you occasionally get in Marx and that has attracted a great deal of scholarly commentary um, in which the focus is on purely on the growth of <clears throat> productive power. And then the argument is that you can sort of look at any society and sort of cut it into three pieces. One part at the highest level is sort of what the, he calls the ideological superstructure. Mm -hmm. These are moral, political, philosophical, religious ideas that are characteristic of any epoch. Then there are the relations of production. Uh, that's the middle level, which is um, basically the distribution of property rights. So under capitalism, right, um, most of us have a property right only in one form of productive power, namely our labor power, right? Uh, <clears throat> I sell my labor power to the University of Chicago. And God bless them, they pay me well. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I don't really, I mean, I own little bits of Microsoft, you know, thanks to retirement accounts and so on. But I don't really own um, other kinds of productive uh, power in our, in our society. Um, whereas other people, Bill Gates, right, he owns, right, massive amounts of productive power in the form of technology, right, Microsoft. Um <clears throat> So, you know, Marx's thought is that depending on, uh, sorry, that's the relation to production. I, I shouldn't sidetrack myself here. Um, and then the, what's often called the material base is the level of development of productive power in that society. And sometimes historical materialism is characterized as the view that um, the ideological superstructure is explained by the contribution it makes to legitimizing or sustaining the relations of production. And the relations of production are explained by the fact that they facilitate the further development of the existing productive power or technology. Yeah. Um, and that's the more sort of functionalist gloss on historical materialism that G.A. Cohen um, uh, sort of put to the forefront of uh, of scholarship on Marx in the late 1970s. And so <clears throat> productive power and technology sound like they really go hand in hand, but they're not the same. Um, they're not entirely the same, right? Because, <clears throat> I mean, human labor power is a kind of productive power. <clears throat> but human labor power has not grown very significantly over history. It's a little greater now than it was 2,000 years ago, because people tend to be stronger and bigger <laughs> than they were. Um, the real growth in productive power uh, occurs through the growth in what I'm calling very broadly technology. But technology, you can think of it as any tools that, um, that people are using to increase uh, what they can produce given various uh, natural resources, right? So, you know, early developments in technology were, you know, simple things like um, the bow and arrow, 
Right? That was an important technological development. Spears, good technological development. Guds, oh boy, that was a big technological development. But nothing like the growth in technology that occurred starting with the Industrial Revolution in the 18th century. Right? This was an extraordinary transformation. Right? So the development of the power loom, right? Uh, which is a machine, right, that can weave cloth um, and a couple of people can run a power loom and produce more cloth than hundreds of individual weavers could produce, given the same amount of time. Um, you know, steam power, water power, then coal power, right? All of these developments increased productive power quite dramatically. Um, and the computer revolution has done something, um, has done something similar. As well as you know various other you know technological developments just over the just over the last fifty years, so the productive power of humanity between seventeen fifty and eighteen fifty you know increased more dramatically more than it had in the prior four or five thousand years right? um, and this is the point of course at which Marx comes on the scene in the mid nineteenth century as witness to this, uh, these dramatic transformations brought on by the, by the Industrial Revolution and the rise of modern capitalism. And part of Marx's thought, which I think is correct, is that capitalist relations of production, that is where you have some people who own technology and who invest money solely to get more money out of the system, right, profit, that um, that way of organizing economic production was particularly good at developing technolog technology and productive power. Right? Um, and, uh, you know, and I think he was right about this, right? that uh, capitalism is remarkably good um, at developing productive power and in particular in developing new, new technologies because um, capitalists basically live or die on their ability to do that. This is why they're so good at it is because their existence depends on it, uh, to put it a little too simply. But that is, I, I think, the core part of Marx's observation. And my guess is that it's in the interest of those who own or control the means of production to improve the technology, to increase their own productive power. But then at the same time, it's probably likely not in the interest of the laborer because then their labor becomes less valuable. Right. So the the interest of the cap the capitalists have only one interest, which is profit. Right? And so increasing productive power is potentially a way to increase profit. Okay. Um, now it gets complicated because if any one capitalist, you know, embraces a technological innovation which allows him to produce more commodities with the same amount of labor time, for example, right? and thus increase their, their profit margin. Initially, that capitalist will have an advantage over his or her competitors, but then, of course, all the other capitalists will invest in the same technology. Right? Um, and so then the whole thing starts, starts over again. But, but I think the, the key thing to emphasize is that capitalists have no interest in increasing their productive power per se. They have only one interest, which is profit, right? And now how can they get profit? Well, they can pay their workers less, they can make them right, work more, right? Um, or they can reduce their overall costs. And one way to reduce overall costs, and in particular to reduce labor costs, human labor costs, is to substitute technology for human labor power, which is the sense in which Capitalism ultimately becomes a problem for those who have only one thing to sell, which is their which is their labor power. And the incentive structure of capitalism is such that this is exactly what capitalists are always trying to do. And we've been seeing it, you know, in, in our own world in you know, little bits and pieces. Right. I mean, you're you're younger than me, but you're old enough to remember when most stores had cashiers. Right. Um, yes. Yeah. And now you go into the CVS or the Walgreens or whatever, and <laughs> there's still some staff, right? But now people are checking themselves out with those little scanners, you know, and, and so on. Right? That's a little technological innovation that it was displacing human labor power. Uh, driverless vehicles, you know, driverless trucks—they're in development. 
probably within the next 10 or 15 years, we're going to start seeing a lot of them. Um, there are 3 million people in the United States who drive trucks, roughly. Um, and, uh, you know, it is a low skill job. You can sell your labor power to drive a truck without having gone to college. Right? Um, and all those jobs are going to disappear. Um, you know, those are little examples of what what the broader development is, you know, chat GPT has just arrived on the scene. You know, mm-hmm. right now there's a lot of hysteria about it and it's, it's not very good at anything that's remotely complicated. Um, and there's a lawyer in New York who just learned you can't have chat GPT write your brief for you because chat GPT just makes up cases. And it doesn't just make up cases. It makes up citations to the cases. It makes up quotes, right? Because it, it doesn't think, right? It's just, you know, mm-hmm. surveying this massive database and making predictions about what word should come next. Um, but still, right, uh, it is an example. Artificial intelligence is an example of something that um, displaces human labor power, right? You know, when I was growing up, uh, whenever they wanted to collect tolls on the highway, there was only one way to do it. They had to have a toll booth and there had to be a person there who took your money and let you get through. Those have almost completely disappeared, right? Now we mm-hmm. have, you know, uh, those little cameras or whatever that pick up your, you have your little box on the front window shield, right? Those are the kind of things that are, are visible that are happening. Um, but, you know, then there's also what's going on in the context of industrial production, right? And has been going on, you know, for now, 50 years or so, where um, machines replace various work that uh, that human laborers used to do on assembly lines, you know, um, for example. Um, so, uh, you know, this is this is a, a big part of why, you know, M- Marx shares with Milton Friedman, as I like to point out to people, especially around here. <laughs> Marx shares with, you know, Milton Friedman, right? A number of ideas, including that capitalism is remarkably good at developing technology and productive capacity. Right? All those things that Chicago School believes about economics and about capitalism in that regard are probably correct. Marx agrees with Milton Friedman that the corporation has only one purpose, which is to pursue profit. Right? Milton Friedman uh, was criticized quite extensively for that, which is, as it were, typical of the ideology of the mainstream media, because all he was observing is the basic fact of how a capitalist system works. Right? A corporation that doesn't pursue profit will cease to exist. Full stop. Um, you know, so he agrees with you know Milton Friedman on a lot of these kinds of issues. Um, but what the people like Milton Friedman and the Chicago School don't understand is they don't understand that the entire logic of how capitalism operates is eventually going to be bad news for 95% of the human beings on the planet Earth (laughs) because Mm -hmm. most people have only their labor power to sell and capitalists have are in endless competition with each other to reduce their costs and increase their profit margins, which means they have a continual incentive to get rid of human labor power as an expense in favor of technology when technology is cheaper, which it almost always is over the long haul. So in that sense, things can only end badly. Right. Um, and, you know, now Marx was a, a very optimistic fellow. Um, you know, Hegel was an optimistic fellow, but he had the excuse of being a Christian. <laughs> and uh, But Marx was not, you know, was, was an atheistic thinker. But Marx, Marx remained optimistic that capitalism would necessarily self-destruct. And while capitalism may ultimately self-destruct, it's not clear that it, it has to end in a better state of affairs. Right? As we quote in the book, and you may remember, I mean, Rosa Luxemburg, who was a Marxist political activist and theoretician in the early 20th century, you know, she said the ultimate choice is going to be between socialism and barbarism, right? By which she meant the following, which is when we get to a point where the productive power produced by capitalism is so great that we could actually produce most things that people need or all things that people need, and maybe a lot of things people want. But if that productive power is entirely in the hands of capitalists who want to utilize it only for profit, we're going to have a problem, right? And um, 
either we're going to have socialism, that is where productive power is socially owned and used to meet social needs, or we're going to have barbarism, that is where the capitalist class uses brute force to protect its control of productive power and, um, and the rest of humanity be damned. Um, and sad to say, I think that diagnosis was probably correct, right? I mean, you know, in some places we're veering towards barbarism, the United States. Uh, we haven't quite gotten there yet, thankfully, but give it another 25 years <laughs> mm. or 50 years. Uh, and, you know, in other places, they're veering a little more towards something like socialism. But uh, it's, it's very un uncertain how this is going to play out. Um but, uh, you know, I won't be here in 100 years. You may be. <laughs> Maybe. And uh, I wish you luck. <laughs> yeah. I vote for have... socialism over barbarism. Mm -hmm. um, well, a, a few things uh, in response to what you just said. One, I hadn't heard about this New York lawyer using ChatGPT to write his brief. And that's very funny. Uh, it, it was I in the New York Times just a couple of days ago. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but then just a, a, a point of clarification, yeah. when when you say that the capitalist has only one interest, profit, are you speaking as Brian, the possible Marxist, or just as an exegesis of Marx's views and characterizing the archetype of the capitalist? Well, it was, it was more the latter, but I, I do think it okay. was, it's a correct assessment. Right. OK. That is the capitalist qua capitalist has only one interest. Now, an individual capitalist, you know, may be interested in poetry on the side or whatever. That's not right. the point. But as a capitalist, what it means to be a capitalist means that you lay out money, you invest money in, you know, raw materials, in labor power, in technology in order to sell those commodities and get more money out of the, the whole process. That's the entire raison d'etre of the whole thing, right? It's not a charitable organization. It's not there to promote social justice, right, or environmental well-being. To the extent those affect consumer behavior, capitalists can get interested in them. That's partly what we're seeing now in some sectors. But that's only because it proves to be profitable. Because the basic right. rule of capitalism is if you're not producing a profit, right, um, then you're going to be put out of business. Right, by your competitors, right? Your competitor capitalists, right? I mean, if I decide, you know, if I decide I'm a capitalist, but I'm a very nice guy, I am a nice guy, right? But I don't know if I'd survive being a nice guy if I were a capitalist. But if, you know, if I'm a good hearted capitalist and I say, geez, my workers really should get paid a lot more money, you know? And so I'm going to pay them a lot more money with the result that my profit margin goes way down. Or no, I don't want my profit margin to go down that much, so I raise the prices on my commodities. But then all the other capitalists who aren't so nice, they're not going to do that. And so they'll, you know, sell their commodities for less than I sell mine because I'm a little too good to my employees. And the result will be that I'll ultimately go out of business. Right? That's how capitalism works. Right? You know, unless all the capitalists miraculously all became good hearted in the same way, or unless they are forced by state power, right, to all pay their workers more, for example, right? Uh, any one capitalist who tries to, who undercuts their own profit margins is going to get destroyed in the marketplace. That's how it works, right? And pretending otherwise, you know, which even the critics of Milton Friedman wanted to do is, is in a way just childish. And so I, so I do think Marx has diagnosed this completely correctly, but so did Milton Friedman, ironically enough, right? They both saw that this is, uh, you know, Friedman put it as though, you know, Friedman said the only thing the cap, uh, corporation should care about is profit. Right? But it's not really a normative judgment. Right? It's a descriptive one. It's a descriptive claim, which is that any corporation that doesn't keep an eye on profit is going to cease to exist at some point in the future. You know? And that's the logic. That's the nature of capitalism. Uh if that's not true, then it's not capitalism. We've got some other economic system going on. Mm -hmm.